Lately, I've been thinking about the rapid pace of development in large language models and what it is that one can do to stay relevant in an era where these AI are writing better and better code on a daily basis. So no longer is it really feasible to be uh, someone who is hyper specialized in one particular niche. You can't simply be a web developer. You can't simply be a game developer. You have to have a huge amount of breadth because as you can see, these large language models, they, they produce huge amounts of code very, very quickly. I mean, this is something I can scroll all the way back and you can see these conversations uh, where it spits out line after line after code at a pace much faster than anything I could ever hope to match. And so what is one to do to keep up with this, right? Uh, I do have a few ideas on that, and today I'm going to share one idea with you. But first, if you're new here, I am Phil Tabor. I'm a physics PhD and a former Intel semiconductor process engineer, and I've recently taken an interest in artificial intelligence. Enough about me. Let's talk about you. One thing I think is going to be critical is to take advantage of their weaknesses. Now, one really big weakness of large language models that you can take advantage of is the fact that they have to be trained on large amounts of data. That means it takes a while for new data to come out, right? And so where is one place that we as humans can acquire new data on a daily basis? And that is, of course, the archive. Here we're given new data every single day on new techniques, new technologies, new developments in uh, virtually every single field. If you're not familiar with the archive, it is a preprint server for scientific papers. Now, these aren't the final product that go to the journals. This is where people kind of put stuff to stake their claim. But in general, they're close enough to what the final product will be that you can use this as a means of keeping abreast of what's going on in the world. And in particular, uh, if you're a viewer of my channel, um, I have a huge interest in reinforcement learning. It's kind of my central interest. And you can see, you know, many, many papers that come out every single day, uh, some of which have overlap with large language models, um, which one can learn from and keep abreast of new changes in uh, reinforcement learning and really any other topic. There's obviously physics, chemistry, astrophysics, anything you want to know about is here. And I think that this one critical skill is a necessary but not sufficient condition to help make sure that you don't become obsolete in the future, which is to say that you must learn how to read papers. And if you're doing computer science, it's especially helpful if you can learn how to implement these papers. Now, of course, I have videos on this channel on how to do that. So if that's something that interests you, subscribe for more. If not, by all means, start digging into these papers and doing it on your own. It's something you can do. I believe in you, uh, but you must do it in order to stay relevant in the future. But really quickly, let's just take a look at one paper to get an idea of how you might actually do this. So if you're new to all of this, uh, papers are generally divided up into a number of sections, and uh, you'll see a lot of overlap between papers where they have common sections. One critical thing is the abstract. It gives you a general idea of what the paper is about. Uh, you read this to kind of scan it to see if it's a paper worth reading, or, you know, the combination of the abstract and the title tells you, hey, should I bother reading this? And if so, then you dig deeper into the paper, of course. Now, introduction contains a lot of material around uh, background in the field, things like related works, what people have done before, and most importantly, generally people will talk about what their contribution is because the whole point of publishing papers is you're doing something new and novel that other people should care about. So reading the introduction, particularly skimming through stuff that you already know, because if you're reading papers on the daily, you're going to be building up your expertise pretty quickly. And so eventually you'll be able to just kind of skim through the intro to get to the good stuff where they talk about what is new. And then a lot of papers will have background information, which may contain a lot of mathematics, a lot of theory, uh, depending on your level of expertise in mathematics or the topic under study, you may or may not want to read that in depth. Then usually they'll get to the methods that talk about exactly how they did what they did. Now, um, one thing, one caveat here is that nobody includes all of the details of everything they did, even in a relatively open field like artificial intelligence research, where most people are publishing on the archive instead of paid journals. Um, people aren't really publishing all of the details. They aren't giving you every single thing uh, that they did to make the experiments work. And the reason they do this is, of course, because everyone has a competitive advantage, or so they think, and they want to maintain that. They want to give enough detail such that other experts can replicate it, but newcomers uh, have a bit of a moat to get across to actually you know, get to the stage of being able to reproduce these results exactly. And so when you're 
implementing these things on your own, keep in mind that you're only looking for, uh, to replicate the sort of general overall trend in their research. You aren't looking to replicate the results exactly. And in some cases, if you had the benefit of implementing older uh, papers, so you'll have some new insights that they didn't have at that time, you may actually outperform their results. That happens as well. But keep in mind that not everything you need to know is contained in a single paper. So they will have some methods that tell you what they did, of course, leaving some things out. And then generally they'll talk about results. And of course the results is where all of the exciting stuff in the paper is. Uh, this paper, actually I need to go and read this. This looks like they include a huge amount of detail and some rather nice looking plots. But uh, following the um, results, they'll typically have some sort of discussion to tie everything together. And they'll want to address some potential some potential criticisms from um, reviewers if they're submitting it to an actual paid journal. Uh, if you're not familiar with the scientific process, you have an idea, you test the idea, design a series of experiments, you write them up in a paper, you submit them to a journal, simultaneously uploading your preprint to the archive. And what happens next is the editor of the journal decides, hey, is this something that uh, a, the journal actually deals with, and B, is it something that people would be interested in? And if so, they kick it down to some other reviewers who happen to be your competition in the field. And those reviewers are going to find any excuse they can to tear it down. And so when you're writing a paper, you want to uh, include possible things that the reviewers might pick at and kind of sort of sidestep or deal with those issues head on before they become an actual issue. And of course, the conclusion draws everything together. There are some acknowledgments thanking the people that helped them along the way and a whole bunch of references. Uh, if you want to gain depth and expertise in a field, reading the references is a good idea. You don't have to do all of them. Uh, after you read a dozen or so papers, you'll get the idea of which papers are cited most often. Those are the ones you should probably read. So this is going to be a critical skill set moving into the future for non-academics. If you're an academic, you're already doing this. This isn't something new to you. Uh, but if you're not an academic, if you're a hobbyist or someone just starting out, maybe you have a bachelor's degree in computer science and you want to do something new, then you're going to have to dig into the literature and you're going to have to become an expert at staying abreast of what's going on. And of course, the archive, arxiv.org, is the best place to go for that. And of course, you know, keep abreast of the news from other uh, YouTube channels that give you the kind of news, but I wouldn't get obsessed with keeping track of the actual marketing materials that companies are putting out. You don't want to be an expert in uh, the glossy kind of stuff they sell to the people. You want to be an expert in the actual mathematics, the actual engineering behind all of these things and whatever field you're studying. I don't know everything you're doing, but hopefully you have some base expertise that you know more about than most people, and so you want to keep abreast on that. Well, I hope that was helpful. This is just one, what I think is a necessary but not sufficient condition to maintain relevance in the new sort of AI era where LLMs have huge amounts of knowledge and are capable of putting things together relatively quickly. There will be more ideas in the future, of course. This isn't the only thing you have to do, but it is one of them, and it is something you should start on immediately because it's free to do, and it's relatively easy once you get the hang of it. Just read a few papers, then read a few more, make a habit of it every single day, and within a few months, you'll be a, an entirely new programmer, an entirely new scientist. For more discussions like this, make sure to subscribe, hit the bell icon so you get notified when I release a new video, and I'll see you in that next video.